So just go ahead and introduce yourself and tell me your name and where you work. You could also mention where you have worked in the past because you okay. kind of jumped around. And then yeah. what your position is now and maybe what you got started in. So my name is Jim Johnson, um, currently serving as the program leader for forestry and natural resources extension uh, with Oregon State University in Corvallis, Oregon. I've been in this position since 2006, so a little over 12 years. Prior to moving to Oregon, uh, I had a similar position in the state of Virginia. I worked at Virginia Tech. Um, uh, more recently as the Associate Dean for Outreach and Extension in the College of Natural Resources and the Environment there and was the program leader for the Forestry and uh, Natural Resources Extension Program. Uh, began my extension career um, in Virginia as a statewide silviculture extension specialist, a position that I held for about five years before moving on into uh, in an in administrative position. So. I've been um, overall in extension now for about 30 years. Um, so before I forget, but um, you are, so you're in administration, so could you talk a little bit about what you think about are important things to think about for promotion and tenure and um, you know what, what new extension specialists or even agents have to think about as they um, get started that's important for moving towards that goal? Yeah, so promotion and tenure, it, it's, it's interesting. Um, so it varies so much by state, uh, especially when it comes to extension, because extension is handled differently um, in different states. And in some cases, the promotion and tenure tracks for people that work in the field, field faculty or field extension agents might differ from what would be required for a statewide specialist perhaps working in a department on the main campus. So uh, there is a lot of variability state to state. Uh, my experience is mostly within Virginia and Oregon, and I would say both of those states are somewhat similar <clears throat> in regards to how promotion and tenure is viewed, particularly for the statewide specialist. So um, coming on uh, for a new person, uh, it's really, really important to identify uh, what's expected, uh, what's in the position description, and more particularly what the department and perhaps the college and the extension service are looking for. One of the best tips I could give would be to uh, find uh, some other extension specialists, whether they're in your college or perhaps another one who've been successful through the system and buy them a cup of coffee, talk with them. Uh, in some cases, maybe even uh, create a mentor-mentee mentor relationship with them, uh, because those are the folks that have been successful where you are, and uh, that's probably the, the most important thing. Having a good relationship with the department head and the other decision makers up the chain is always good, making sure that they know and understand what it is that you're doing. Um, don't just uh, take your job and go off and come back five years later or six years later and apply for tenure. <laughs> it's really, really good to make sure that uh, all the people who are, are going to be having an influence on the promotion and tenure are, are aware of what it is that you're doing and uh, how you're being successful. What, um, can you speak to a little bit about how you think that tenure and promotion and responsibilities might have changed? throughout your career and like in terms of what you've seen so when you started what maybe your expectations seem like and then what kind of balancing act is expected now yeah so that's a great question how has how how have the expectations and requirements for promotion and tenure changed over over my career and before coming into extension i had previously uh, worked for 10 years uh, in extension excuse me in teaching and research and so in my personal situation, I achieved tenure and promotion to associate professor at one institution, and then I changed to institutions, and I gave tenure up and had to win it back again in my second institution. Uh, the first time it was as a teaching professor, the second time was as an extension professor. So I've had that interesting contrast. So that was years ago, actually decades ago, um, today, I would say over the years, uh, if 
if anything, the requirements and the expectations have just increased. It, it's more difficult for young people today coming into the profession to achieve success. The, the standards have moved up pretty much across the board in terms of numbers of publications, amount of ex external funding brought in. Back in my day, it was perfectly fine to say, gee, I did 25 extension programs this year. Uh, today, we expect more than that. We not only expect the productivity, the programs, but we want to know what happened as a result of it. So when I first started, nobody talked about impact analysis. Uh, but today, you know, having, having impacts, being able to demonstrate impacts and have a good, clear evaluation data is, is really important. And that's something that I think has evolved over the years. So. Uh, yeah, the bar has gotten higher, I would say, um, over the course of my career, certainly. It's more difficult when I look at the promotion package that I stood up on uh, way back when I became tenured and what is expected today is, is clearly a difference. Um, is there any kind of advice you would give or um, advice that's given to you that um, helped you achieve, uh, uh, do well in your extension career? or? or uh any stories that kind of demonstrate some of that or demonstrate yeah. mistakes that you wish you hadn't made? Oh, uh, yeah, sure. We, if we want to talk about mistakes, uh, this could be a long interview. Um, I think when I came, when I came into Extension, um, uh, like many people, I, had, I came in from a more academic background. I had a PhD and a lot of technical knowledge in my field, which was important to get the job. Without that, I wouldn't have gotten the job. But what I didn't have was uh, principles of adult education, how to set up and run field tours, and how to um, design, develop and design really good educational programs for people who were uh, voluntarily coming, you know, people who are there at, uh, at the program by choice, not because it's required for a class uh, in a degree program. So making the switch from undergraduate and graduate students to teaching um, adults, forest landowners, uh, for example, was one of my primary audiences, um, really uh, was something I had to learn on the job. And again, uh, I learned a lot by trial and error. I learned a lot by um, connecting with people that I felt were successful and seeing how they conducted themselves and the programs that they that they developed, um, and uh, working with my, my fellow uh, specialists uh, on collaborative programs. That was one of the things that I was able to do early on was to team up on a number of larger projects with not only people from my own institution, but people from other institutions as well. And it gave me an opportunity to build some some collaborators outside the state on a regional basis, and um, that those some of those relationships that I built 30 years ago still endure today, um, still very close, at, and uh, work with some of those people that I first met back almost 30 years ago. Um, is there anything else you'd like to add? So, um, I think. Um, when it comes to um, when it comes to young people um, finding and working with a mentor is something that um, can be handled two ways. It can be prescribed, or it can be something that that you seek out on your own. And my sense is that the latter is a better way to go. I'm not sure that you can force a mentor-mentee relationship. It, it has to be something that's voluntary on both parts. Um, the mentor has to be someone that the mentee looks up to, respects, and really wants to be close to and develop a relationship with. And um, so for that reason, we've avoided assigning mentors to newer agents and specialists but rather try to encourage that relationship to occur more uh, organically. Um, and I think when that happens, uh, when that relationship becomes strong, it's, it's much more beneficial to the, 
to the mentee than if it was a, a sort of a structured uh, kind of a, almost a mentorship by committee sort of thing, which I do see occurring. There's a lot of emphasis these days on developing mentor and mentee relationships, and I think that's good, but I think it's something that can't be forced. It has to be something that you seek out. So uh, that for the young uh, uh, or incoming uh, newer faculty, being able to identify who those people are and developing a relationship with them early on, I think, is a key thing. But it's something that you need to be a little bit more proactive about and may not just come to you and knock on your door and say, hey, I have all this free time on my hand. Uh, can I be your mentor? It doesn't really work that way. Uh, and I have one more question on that. It's been off. So, um, so what I think about, too, is that um, sometimes people that you would choose for a mentor or who naturally be kind of be kind of offer up that mentoring relationship. They might give you bad advice or advice that was relevant to their situation when they started. So mm -hmm. how do you kind of navigate that challenge or yeah. or deciding what if yeah. their advice yeah. is is good for you or not? Yeah. So um, as a as an incoming young professional, you've got to find your own path. And you have to figure out what works with you. No two people work in the same way. And it's like, um, it's, it, it's like uh, a train comes by with all this stuff on it. And you can get to pick off those things that you think are going to be helpful and useful to you. It doesn't mean you have to pick off everything that comes by. Uh, you're going to get some opinions and some advice uh, that you're just going to want to ignore. <laughs> or you might take it and try things and find out it doesn't work and think, oh, okay, lesson learned, I'm not going to do that again. So uh, if something sounds wrong to you, like it's not going to fit with your style or it's not something that you would normally do or something that you just don't think would work with your audiences today, may have worked 20 or 30 years ago, uh, but you don't think it's going to fit with what you're trying to accomplish today, don't, don't worry about it. Just smile and say thank you very much and then, and then um, decide that that's a piece of advice you're not going to take. There's absolutely nothing in the world wrong with ignoring advice that you think is going to take you somewhere that you don't want to go. So that's, that's all part of having a good relationship with a mentor because if you have a good relationship, the mentor isn't going to get bent out of shape if you don't take a piece of advice. You know, you can always talk it through and say, you know, I just don't think that's going to work for my program that I'm trying to develop or for this audience that I'm trying to reach because these things change over time. And we're finding out now we're struggling as we're transitioning from an older generation of audience, uh, particularly with forest landowners, which as I mentioned is my primary audience, um, to younger people that choose to get their information and their knowledge in different ways than their parents and their grandparents did. So um, we need fresh ideas. And one of the best ways to get those is to hire new people in that have those ideas. Anything else? Good. Cool.